March 29, 1984, a Maltese freighter named the Aldea was on a passage from St. John, New Brunswick to Norfolk, Virginia. As she passed the tip of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, she ran into a fierce northeast storm with gale force winds and high seas. The ship was in a light condition, and when the winds approached hurricane force, the crew lost control of their vessel. Late in the afternoon, the vessel lost power and was blown ashore on Nauset Beach in Orleans. The United States Coast Guard, as is their tradition, made a dramatic rescue of the 23 crewmen by helicopter in 80 knot winds and landed them on the beach without mishap. Cape Codders awoke the next morning to find a 16,000 dead weight ton freighter high and dry on their beach. Hundreds of people gathered on the dunes and trekked down over the sands, braving the sharp winds for a close-up view of the vessel. The immediate concern was that another storm with heavy seas might break up the hull and cause an oil spill. The Coast Guard's Atlantic Strike Force team arrived on the scene to supervise the unloading of 160,000 gallons of heavy black fuel from the grounded freighter to avoid any oil being spilled along Nauset Beach, one of the most popular bathing beaches on Cape Cod. Very quickly, hoses were hooked up to the Aldea and stretched a half mile across the dunes for the offloading of the fuel oil. The oil snaked through a series of pumps and hoses and then was deposited in tank trucks, which were parked nearby in the Pochet area of Orleans. There was no oil spilled and all of the fuel was removed safely. Almost every day, the news helicopters buzzed around the ship like flies and the beach parking lot filled with tourists. The Eldia came ashore near the spot where the first shipwreck occurred on Cape Cod in 1626, commemorated by an historic marker nearby. It wasn't long before some Cape Cod entrepreneurs took advantage of the hoopla surrounding the stranded ship and began marketing t-shirts with the latest shipwreck printed on the front. On a warm day in mid-April, the beach was crowded and thousands gladly undertook the mile-long trek down the beach to see this spectacular sight. Of course, not everyone came down to the beach to view the shipwreck. During her seven weeks ashore, the ship became a major Cape Cod tourist attraction and a news media event. Subsequent to the grounding, the owners of the Aldea signed a contract with Don John Marine and McAllister Towing and Salvage in a joint venture to remove the vessel from the beach. Workmen soon began to move their salvage gear down to the grounded freighter. Compressors, pumps, welding machines, and heavy pulling cables, as well as tools, blocks, and wires were all landed at the Nauset Beach parking lot and carried down to the ship by tractors. The ship had been surveyed and salvage plans called for the laying of two sets of beach gear, which included huge anchors to be placed offshore and connected by wire cable to four sets of blocks on the deck of the Aldea. A salvage derrick was to be anchored offshore to add its pull to the 200 ton pull of the beach gear. Once the equipment arrived on the beach, it all had to be hoisted aboard and sorted out. Four members of the original Filipino crew were retained to run the machinery aboard the vessel and to assist the salvers in the refloating of their ship. Another trailer load of gear arrived and more equipment was offloaded into a tractor for transportation to the ship. The Eldia lay about one mile from the parking lot and the route went over soft sand. The four-wheel drive vehicles had to be used to maneuver around the dunes to get to the ship. As time passed, each tide deposited more sand around the vessel, and another sandbar was building off the bow, which locked the Aldea in position. At high tide, the ocean waves created post guard pictures when they slammed against the side of the ship. Aboard the Aldea, workmen began to arrange their gear. The port side main deck was kept clear in order to lay out the blocks and wires for pulling. On the starboard side, the air compressors, water pumps, and welding machines took up most of the free space. Prior to welding, the edges of a lug are dressed with a burning torch. Two of these lugs had to be welded on the starboard bow. Workmen attached brackets for the welding platform. Back aft on the port side, two heavy lugs were welded in place. 
These welds had to be nearly perfect as each would be subjected to 100 tons of pull when the winches took up the strength. Pounding on the beach, the Aldea suffered some structural damage. The damage was heaviest in the number four hold. The tank top was bowed up and there were 23 holes to be patched. Workmen used quick setting concrete deep in number four hole to patch some leaks. Concrete used in marine salvage must be quick setting and adhere to wet steel. It's mixed in small batches and applied to the leaky area by hand. This patch was built up around a drain pipe which tapped off the water while the concrete was setting. Afterwards, the pipe was kept. With the leak stopped, steel boxes were welded in the dry around the concrete, thus completing the seal. While the work continued in the number four hold, the rigger's topside set up a reel of one inch steel wire and pulled it out on deck to reeve an elaborate set of blocks. The salvage master and foreman discussed the salvage plans while the ubiquitous helicopters buzzed overhead, making pictures for the evening newscasts. The Aldea lay on the Nauset sands like a beached whale. There was much work in store before the ship could be freed from her sandy perch. The late March storm had laid the vessel high up on the beach and subsequent tidal action moved large amounts of sand around her. At low tide, it was nearly possible to walk completely around the vessel without getting your feet wet. An inspection by the salvage master revealed that a large amount of sand would have to be moved before the actual salvage could begin. The tourist continued to drive to Nauset Beach to view the stranded ship. The beach personnel hired to oversee traffic had to be paid, so the town of Orleans began charging a $2 daily fee for parking. This did not stop the visitors. They lined up and paid on their way in. The local entrepreneurs came up with some new ideas. One shop created a coffee mug with the Aldea printed on the side. They sold by the thousands. Postcards appeared at other gift shops and they were the hottest items in town. With thousands of persons coming down each weekend, business was brisk. Shipwreck watchers collected postcards, coffee mugs, and donned their shipwreck t-shirts. The largest piece of equipment used in the salvage of the Aldea was the Derrick Century, which was towed to Cape Cod from New York by the tug ITCO 12. The Century arrived in Provincetown Harbor at the tip of Cape Cod to unload a big machine, a 12-yard bucket loader. The machine was lifted off the Century by her large boom and gently placed on land while a crowd of onlookers watched and waited. 
soon as the lift cables were removed, the machine operator climbed aboard and began the long journey overland to Nauset Beach. The bucket loader was 14 feet wide and commanded the lion's share of a two-lane highway. The road south was four lanes, so with a police escort, there were few snags. The move was made late in the day, and as the sun went down, the last part of the 30-mile trip was made with lights. After the bucket loader left Provincetown, the Derrick Sentry was taken in tow again and brought down the backside of Cape Cod, and the next morning was anchored near shore just off the grounded freighter. Work began at once, setting up the gear on the Derrick Sentry. Cables had to be passed between the Sentry and the Aldea. 1,200 feet of polypropylene line was spliced together and then stretched out between the two vessels and used to pull the cables between them. The Sentry is a unique floating derrick designed especially for marine salvage. She is fitted with a 115-foot boom and is capable of lifting 600 tons. She is steam-powered and is held in place by her anchors. To make connections between the Sentry and the Aldea, a small Boston whaler was used to run the pilot lines for the heavier wires. While the beach gear was being set up on the port side of the Aldea, the next step was to set anchors and run the large cables out to the derrick. Aboard Century, the cables were attached to 16,000-pound anchors, which were set about 1,700 feet offshore. One of the hazardous operations aboard the Aldea was the laying of the large pulling cables. The snaking overboard of the heavy cables was an uncontrolled movement, and workmen had to remain clear to avoid any injuries. In addition to the concrete patching, there was major structural damage to the number four hold that needed extensive repairs. The tank top had buckled and was detached from the frames of the ship. 12-inch I-beams were lowered into the hold and welded into place. The ship's winches moved them into place over corresponding frames to strengthen the starboard side to avoid further damage during the pulling operations. Once in position, the beams were welded in place. The Aldea was originally constructed as a log carrier, so the overall strength of the hull was above average. The work on the derrick and the ship carried on, and the only other problem was the tons of sand that had to be moved from around the Aldea. A large bulldozer was hired from a local construction firm and joined the 12-yard bucket loader on the beach near the bow of the Aldea and began to move the sand. The two machines worked together to shave down the sandbar that had built up off the port bow of the ship. Although each tide deposited more sand around the Aldea, the machine operators, working at low tide only, made steady progress in lowering the level of the sandbar. The last week in April and the first two weeks of May were used for preparations. Laying anchors, running cables, and setting up the necessary gear to pull the ship off the beach, plus a thousand and one other details that had to be attended to in an operation of this magnitude. On board the Century, a corresponding set of blocks to those set up on the Aldea were ready to pull together in order to obtain the maximum pulling power to move the ship. Pleasant weather continued. With ideal conditions, the progress moved along at a fast pace. In early April, just after the Aldea was driven ashore, 3,000 tons of seawater was pumped into number two and number three holes as ballast to hold the ship in her position to avoid any further movement. This water had to be pumped off before the vessel could be refloated. The pumping took the better part of a day and while the pumps worked below, the salvers stretched the blocks out on deck, 
weight of the main pulling wire was temporarily taken up by the carpenter stoppers. The ship's winches were used for power. When the beach gear was ready, the slack was taken up in all the wires. The pull is nearly double for each pulley in the system. The pull of the beach gear, together with the century, was in excess of 400 tons. Offshore, two buoys marked the location of the anchors. On board the Aldea, the two cables came aboard around two fair leads and then to the running block. In order to coordinate the operations, communications between the Eldia and the Century were vital. Small, powerful walkie-talkies were used. A last-minute change in the lead of the wire to the winch on the Eldia made it necessary to rig another running block high up on the number three A-frame. The stiff winds posed a safety problem, but the riggers were able to set the block without incident. This block made the rigging more efficient and enabled the salvers to take full advantage of the power of the ship's winches. On the beach, the big bucket loader and the bulldozer were moving more sand. It was necessary to move material from the seaward side of the Aldea, so the machines went outboard of the ship and got their feet wet, so to speak. The vessel had been aground for six weeks, and in that time, the tides had built up a sandbar all around the ship. The Atlantic works on the shoreline of Cape Cod like a huge hydraulic dredge, moving the sugar-like sand back and forth. Before they were through, the machines had moved over 30,000 yards of sand from around the Aldea. After the ship had been refloated, the machines were used to restore the beach to its original condition. To illustrate the setup, the diagram depicts the cables, anchors, and locations of the derrick and the ship in relation to the beach. During the first night of pulling, the vessel was turned out from the beach about 30 degrees. The next morning, the entire scene was enveloped in fog. It was difficult to see any progress, but the diagram shows the turn. After the fog cleared, the results looked promising. The salvers worked to reset the blocks. The high moon tides were occurring around midnight, and the next night the ship was pulled around almost 90 degrees from her original position on the beach. The work at night was under the watchful eyes of the television cameras. Using their floodlights, the event was recorded for the daily newscasts. After the vessel was turned, some progress seaward was also noted, and the next morning the TV cameras had some new pictures to record. The diagram helps to show the progress achieved. The weather was still picture perfect, but at that point in time, the salvers could have used some brisk winds to raise the sea and create a ground swell during the crucial pulling operations. In preparation for the final pull, the salvers took soundings around the ship to determine which part of the ship's bottom was in contact with the remaining sandbar. They then calculated the most advantageous trim to minimize the effects of the sandbar. Ballasting then commenced to achieve the desired trim. Workers set out an absorption boom around the Aldea in case any of the ballast being pumped overboard had any residual oil laying in the tanks. Each day, about 3,000 people came down to watch the refloating progress. Success finally came after three weeks. The salvers had timed the work of their machines and crews to coincide with the high moon tides to pull the Aldea free from Nauset Beach. As the cables were pulled taut again, the ship gently slid over the sands and became a dim shape in the lights. After 49 days aground, the Aldea was afloat once more. The next morning, the vessel lay a couple of hundred yards offshore, free at last of the beach's grasp. The success of the operation was due in large part to the perseverance of the salvers. They had rightly compared the refloating of the Aldea to giving birth to a baby. It would take a little time, but we knew she would come. Later that afternoon, the ship was taken in tow and headed north around Provincetown and into Cape Cod Bay. <laughs>
The last chapter in the story of the visit of the Aldea occurred at the Cape Cod Canal, the day after she was pulled off the beach. The ship continued to attract a crowd no matter where she went. At the east end of the canal, hundreds of people gathered to watch and to take pictures. The Eldia was on her way through the canal headed for Newport, Rhode Island, where she was to be dry docked to determine the amount of damage to her bottom from seven weeks aground on Nauset Beach. There have been thousands of shipwrecks on Cape Cod over the past 350 years, but probably none so well known or publicized as the Aldea. Since the early days, countless vessels have met their fate here. Square riggers, steamships, and schooners have lain their bones on the beaches of Cape Cod. Many of them are still there. However, the Aldea survived.